Oh, um, shitty startup founders, shock horror surprise. So, news broke the other day, I think yesterday actually, via The Verge. Verge uncovered this story, um, great journalism from them, where they essentially exposed the founder of Away Luggage, the luggage company that's been all over the social media feeds for the most part because they've sent out a bunch of products to YouTubers, to some influencers, and got them to make some early reviews. And essentially, it's been billed as a kind of affordable version of Remoa, right? In that regard, they're kind of, you know, banking on the idea that a lot of young people are opting for experiences over possess over kind of material possessions and wanting to show off their, you know, um, idyllic holiday locations. And in comes away luggage with a really kind of cool, hip concept of luggage and promoting it to young kids or young adults, people that are, you know, suddenly trying to, you know, fly in the nest and, you know, seeking out new adventures. All on paper looks amazing, all on paper looks good. They've got, I think, a store in Shoreditch in London, where, where I live somewhere, I'm pretty sure, and probably locations probably in a brother place, but they've been growing very rapidly over the last few months, I would say. So this story came out of the left field. I think if you worked there, you probably know this already. But again, it's no surprise. I think every startup I've worked out for the most part has had this kind of toxic element to it. I think in most parts, because it's unregulated and there is like little to no barrier to kind of for you to start a startup or to get involved in running your small business. There's no real checks and balances involved for the most part. If you have the money, if you have the means, if you have the determination and you have the manpower, you can do just about anything. But it also means you can get away with murder, especially, especially if your product is successful. If your product is a success and it does well, similar to Steve Jobs, you read a documentary, he was a terrible human being, but you know, an amazing icon, innovator in his field. But as a boss, as a co-worker, you wouldn't want to, you know, you wouldn't want to spend, you wouldn't want to be caught at the bar with him on a night out, really, when the work stuff now. He's not the best guy to hang around, with, especially if you've got a deadline coming up. But the problem with startups and problem with most businesses, even just in, in, in life, even in sports, right? The player in your team is the most talented, but also who takes some cuts the most corners, goes out, gets fucked up, does a line of coke off a stripper's ass. It's probably going to be permitted to do what he wants outside of, um, training if he performs on the pitch nine times out of ten because you're banking on those nine times out of ten coming you know during a championship run a trophy run league table finish he's going to really make the difference so you're you're willing to sacrifice his extracurricular activities for the betterment of the overall team same happens in startups if your company's successful you ipo big you sell a lot of units, you're appearing everywhere, you're expanding all over the globe, people will forgive your shitty attitude, just check the, the the former WeWork founder, right? And same goes to the founder I worked at, at People.io, Nicholas Oliver, absolute scumbag, absolute, um, you know, um, he, what you call it, charlatan in that regard, hasn't paid anyone for close to a year where we, we worked for him in my previous company where I was at before, and he had the same sort of attitude, the same sort of toxic sort of personality. So, um, this article here kind of uh, details the whole experience. I'm going to read it out and kind of, you know, try not to get angry with some bits and pieces. But, you know, we'll go as, at a slow pace and try and go from there. So this article is from The Verge. I put it up on here to get to check out. I love the actual icon of it. You know, loads of away luggage is powered up into a side face emoji. Um, it says here, emotional baggage, the headline from The Verge. I'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out yourself, but just quickly read through it. A waste founder saw the vision of travel and inclusion, but former employees say it masks a toxic work environment, right? And another thing as well that's been really interesting about this whole fallout of this whole story is that the CEO, the founder of, of sorry, of Away Luggage is a, is a woman. So some people have had a horrible take on social media where they're essentially saying that, oh, it's unfair that people are pointing out that she's a woman. But it's not because what it should illustrate is that toxic behavior and startups doesn't um, is genderless, right? It doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. That behavior exists all everywhere in all most people. And, you know, um, it's probably also a good thing because it goes to show that some, especially some feminists who are like hell bent on rebalancing, kind of, you know, re readdressing, readdressing the kind of power imbalances in quote unquote in corporate work environments or work environments in general need to come to the realization that it's not the power thing corrupts everybody it doesn't corrupt just men it doesn't make um toxic people it doesn't make talk it doesn't only creep up on the dudes in your office i think most people if they're given that level of power that level of influence that level of control over some people will get a bit crazy especially if the company is doing well and this is a good example of it it's not about men and women it's just about getting rid of toxic people in your company 
point blank and not having environments where staff members are made to feel like shit because they're not willing to work until 11 p.m at night that's not good behavior regardless if you're a guy or a dude no one wants that especially people that are not fully invested in the company and only there to pick up a paycheck which most people are at companies for right so let's continue with the article um a very felt out place um what's that called it um a felt very for very very felt out what a very felt out place at away like many of the executives at the popular direct to consumer luggage brand she's gone to an ivy league college worked at a popular startup and honed an intense work ethic that set her apart from the pack but the higher ups who were almost all white straight and still never gave her the time of day it was very clear who was in the clique Nah, but the white thing is well i'm not a fan of this whole stuff and it's just a coincidence most of these most of these higher ups as well it's mostly due because you know they've been around long enough they've, they've kind of known the game they sussed it out it's gonna take a while for minorities or people who aren't white to kind of you know get a foothold in the industry it's not it's i don't know i can imagine i can remember the first time i worked in startups there weren't a lot of people that look like me right it's just a new thing people are starting to realize you can get into this field there's a low barrier of entry there's no room to grow it's rapidly changing it's going to take time for people to come in and look for this look um for representation to be you know a bit bit more fair and balanced i don't agree with you know uh companies specifically hiring people based on this color or their gender or where they come from and stuff that's a bit weird but it's going to take time for people to be more aware outside of the quote unquote general white guy with a hoodie on. But it's not necessarily a bad thing if they're all white. It just happens to be one of those kind of things. Isn't it? I would say anyway, I'm not just sure. But let's continue anyway. Um, originally, Avery um, had joined because of the brand's popularity. Away luggage, like most people. Um, the hard shot suitcases were everywhere in, in overheads, luggage, carousels, subway ads. But also she wanted to st- believe in the mission. Away promised a lifestyle of inclusion, nice vacations. And that's vacation story. It was also founded by two women, one person of color and who sought to run the globally minded business. In my mind, it was a trivial product, but the brand is more than just luggage, Avery says. It's about travel. As the months went by, she got closer, glimpsed at the growth and the imagined, obs- the image obsessed culture. However, she started to feel like the mission was just a smokescreen to get employees to work harder. Of course, it's always like that. Every startup that is heavily mission based that wants you to believe in this mission and we're going to change the world it's always smokes and mirrors for you to work out um you know ungodly hours bend over give them your asshole and tell them go harder go faster none uh, no exceptions most places that are great places to work at will try and get the right fit the right personality who wants to work at that job and also as an added bonus might believe in what they're doing but the pers- but the fundamental reason why that person he or she will get hired is because they are an expert in their field and that they can perform this given task like exponentially more than anybody else right leaps and bounds better they can get it done quicker they can they have more resources more context whatever it may be but the mission thing is secondary that will come later on most companies i've worked for in my life i've never heard of prior to me working there apart from maybe two or three i've never heard they exist and i don't care about them a prior you we all do the same thing we download the app we go on the website we check out what they're doing and we try and work out how we can add some value to it then along the line as you're working as you're becoming more passionate about your job you're getting better understanding you're performing well you're an attribute to your teammates you're liking their environment then over a period of time that mission statement that goal that they have will then to be, it will then become ingrained in you so much so that you start to believe in it in yourself but to but to suddenly but to think that anyone that starts a job especially someone just looking to get a paycheck is going to suddenly go there because they want to work for you because they believe in the mission is told heartily stupid and the way they try to convince you otherwise is also super manipulative and just goes to show just how shitty some of these founders can be sometimes nicholas oliver former people.io i'm looking at you as well so it continues um like many the the um when the co yeah so so continues here when a co-worker invited everybody to join a private slack channel called hot topics filled with lgbtq folks and people of color she was relieved to find that she wasn't the only one who felt uncomfortable with the ways purported mission and company culture it was a lot like this person did this not work thing or those people did something insensitive she recalls in other words it was a safe space where marginalized employees could vent which again i think is a bit weird and a bit a bit strange i'm not for the whole like in office gossip thing i used to hate that sort of stuff i think presenting this stuff face front um uh, uh, what putting yourself in the front foot and actually going and speaking about these things directly especially during company all hands um it's thing i think is super important even if it means you risk losing your job i think saying it out loud is the best thing the best remedy it also allows other people who aren't as brave to maybe step up and also back you up but saying it quietly behind the uh, the barriers of slack thinking you're on a private channel is ridiculous as well because 
I think for as bad as some startup founders are, I think they're not helped by employees who are meek and unable to speak up for themselves. And the first thing they do is contact a journalist. I don't think that's cool either. I think if your founder is toxic and being a bit of a douche, you owe them enough, especially if they're paying your wages, to at least inform them of your displeasure face-to-face, man-to-man, woman-to-woman, person to person you should be able to do that and if they then don't adhere or they don't listen or they don't try and make the adequate steps to rectify the situation of course take it to the higher ups go to the media whatever it may be but to go straight to the media after a little bit of of, after a few uncomfortable moments or a a series of uncomfortable moments without saying anything in public i think that's a bit bad especially the kind of people who are like gossiping about the founder then they come into the kitchen and all of a sudden they keep quiet and suddenly start pretending that person's their friend oh my god should i get something for lunch do you want to pop out i'm gonna go to the shop do you want something that is that is really snaky and two-faced behavior. You should be able to keep the same energy. If I don't like you at work, even if you're my boss or you're my colleague, you'll know this, right? I'll, I'll let you know for something that you didn't do. But I'm not going to pretend to be your friend one minute and then privately, slack, and privately diss you on a Slack channel. I don't think that's cool. And also, it's not good for the culture. Forget your own personal dislike of the founder. It doesn't really serve anyone any good to know that there is... Because imagine, this is a private slack channel for people that identify as lgbtq plus plus minorities plus anyone else who doesn't want to hang around with the quote-unquote white people what does that do to the people who are white in the office how does that make them feel so what are you pitting themselves against each other does it mean if you're a white person who hasn't speak it up who's not in that channel are you a sort of um are you uh are you an ally to the founder you don't like like what's happening there it doesn't you know what i mean it just creates more toxic behavior and again this is the issue i have with these founders because it's always trickles down see leadership is the most important thing that's why that book great eat, great leaders eat last that title is so important because that level of humility um of letting your kind of employees eat first and then you get whatever's left over that trickles down because then that means next time what what's, what's the next action that happens after that when people are cleaning up their plates your employees are going to start carrying the place of their other employees. So that's stacking them up. If they go and get some more, um, you know, some top-ups, I don't think it doesn't make any sense what I'm talking about, but just go with me. When they go and top up in the buffet, they'll offer, they'll ask their friends or their colleagues or their co-workers if they want an extra bit on top because the founder has set the parameters. They've trickled it down. But if the founder is just the kind of type that just goes and gets their own thing and sits down in the corner somewhere on a laptop, that kind of behavior isn't going to be expected in the workplace. But anyway, let's continue. Um, it was again. It was also against company policy. Um, away embrace Slack in more ways than one. Its co-founder Jen Rubio is engaged to its CEO Stuart Butterfield, but it took things further than most startups. Employees were not allowed to email each other, and direct messages were supposed to be very rare, never about work, and only for small requests like asking if somebody wanted to eat lunch. <laughs> Private channels were also to be created sparingly and mainly for work-specific reasons. So making channels to say to say commiserate about a tough day was not encouraged that's ridiculous the whole reason people use slack is to gossip or to annoy colleagues who they're friends with right or to send gifts and stuff it's not the most productive platform for you to communicate with people i never used to check my slack when i used to work at workplaces i used to just used to like like I'd, i'd either not check my slack or only check the slack channel of the department i was in that was it but there was no chit chat and i just it just annoyed me because it just it just breeded um, people to be... Imagine working in an office where it's open plan workspace. There's no offices, no closed doors. So there's that distraction. Then on top of it, you have Slack. Then on top of it, you have people like me who are loud and noisy. Not the best working environment. So again, I think the announcements and the updates of a team by email that people have to read is fine. That's one requirement. But the Slack thing is another requirement, another dance to do. And then your manager telling you that it's bad, it's prohibited. How are they going to police that? doesn't make any sense. Anyway, it continues here. The rules had been implemented in the name of transparency, but employees say that they, they created a culture of uh, intimidation. Of course they would. The constant surveillance, uh, intimidation and constant surveillance. Once when a suitcase was sent out to a customer's incomplete initials, stenciled into a luggage tag, CEO Steph Corey said the person in charge must have been brain dead and threatened to take over the project. Oh, come on, man. That is not... that. Yeah, that I don't like. You remember somebody is trying to harass you for something that you haven't done yet and then they email you, then they post it on slack channel on slack channel in front of everyone and do the at here thing so everyone can see it that's some snaky shit like really is some snaky shit um in my experience there it's extensive and relentless it was just it wasn't just co-workers pinning things on other people it came from the execs too Corey was infamous for tearing into people in slack you could hear her typing and you knew something bad was going on <laughs> you know <laughs> it's a legend this is a customer experience associate we call caroline yet while her feedback was almost entirely 
it was almost always sent online. It's effects were felt in the real world. Yeah, I hate those kind of fans, man, just who are just hide behind their laptop and say the most vicious things behind the screen and then completely air you in real life. Imagine how tense that environment of what's must be to work at. And again, this isn't uh, a bad indictment on the way only. It's a bad indictment on the whole entire startup scene because these founders exist in most places. I think most people that you've heard, that you, most of your friends that you know work in startup industry, if you used to ask them if they have any horror stories, they'll be able to list a whole bevy of them or founders they work for, people they worked with, um, you know, whatever. Everyone's got one or two stories of people they've worked with that have done that kind of behavior. And I've got loads of them. And it's funny too, because I wonder what happens when founders see those kind of stories. If Are you narcissistic enough not to think that's you or do you think or you just ignore the story like what do you do i wonder um corey was infamous for tearing people tearing into people on slack you could hear her typing and you knew something bad was happening says the former friend caroline yeah well da, da, da. let's see the slack channel let's quickly read this this is a slack channel that she said monogramming foil this is sarah corey um can we ask one of the cameramen to send us photos of the gold following uh, monogram luggage tags for approval before they get packaged for fulfillment? And if they can demonstrate a week of 100% perfect luggage tags, they can begin proceeding without our sign off. Oh, that's an. Imagine a founder, right, of a company like Away wanting to sign off monogram tags on a fucking luggage thing. Don't you have enough to worry about that you're micromanaging luggage tags? Really? Like, that's, that's toxic behavior. Men or women, that's ridiculous. Like, oh so annoying it gets me so riled this sort of stuff anyway um she continues again if we need to ask nick himself to um to be sending us the photos to sign off at this point i think we should um if, if whoever is going is doing these luggage tags is brain dead enough to package up and send a tag that clearly has incomplete letters in it seems extremely unlikely to me that that restraining that a retraining on sops if going to be uh sufficient set set of next steps for us to ensure that 100% of our customers are getting perfect luggage tags. These are representations of our brand. I hate people doing kind of thing, those kind of guilt trips. Go, go jump off a cliff. Company, and if a single additional customer gets an imperfect luggage tag, I am personally overtaking oversight on the monogramming project from the ops team. Uh, and someone says, absolutely. Who was just, I was just about to write an email to quiet, to follow up on our visit and include all that stuff moving forward. What an absolute B-I-T-C-H this woman sounds like. So when the executive's name inexplicably popped up into Hot Topics the morning of May 2018, employees knew something was wrong. She found out about the channel from Erin Guao, the head of people who said language in the room had made at least one person uncomfortable. I f- oh, who snitched on the private channel as well? You absolute donut. Continues. I thought, damn, she's going to see us talking about her. Some stupid stuff, but whatever. Records a former marketing manager named Emily. She hoped Corey could would at least find the conversation funny. That hope evaporated the next day when Corey began calling people into her office one by one. There, flanked by company's head of people and general counsel, she told six people they were going to be let go. What? You've been discriminatory. Employees remember her saying the stuff you said was hateful and even racist. You no longer have a job at this company. Emily, who was a person of color, was shocked. There was a giant. But come on now. Talking behind a, 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 a founder's back on a private Slack channel, do you honestly think Slack is private? You have to be under the assumption that all conversation on Slack can be accessed. That's why I just I will just assume so, right? There is a backdoor to everything. Now Slack can deny that and say otherwise, but I will just assume all the conversation on Slack are are monitored or people will be able to tell. Especially the snitch that report is ahead of people, right? There's people that exist. All these doogers are going to be like, uh, uh, Steph, people are talking about you on Slack. Oh, they're going to be like that. They're going to be running around. So you got to be careful of that. So to 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 be surprised that you get fired for talking shit about your manager. Mm, that's some that's some that's some uh, millennial hollywood shit in it really in it oh my god i'm so surprised that you're letting me go because i was talking rubbish about you behind someone's back like come on what do you expect you called her a bitch of course she's gonna let you go <laughs> god almighty um so evaporated the uh, you know you no longer have a job at this company emily was a person of color was shocked that was jarring three white people telling me i was racist uh you can be racist if you're a person of color by the way bloody hell man where is this idea that pe- people that are black can't be racist this makes no sense jesus christ like what um the company's head of people erin go identifies as a person of color how do you identify but the fact that emily was unaware at the time okay cool uh whatever let's continue cory disputes cory disputes of ever using the term racist and hate speech although multiple sources confirm that these are the words she used of course you're gonna deny it 
deny, deny, deny. Uh, the situation br- uh, bruised people morale. According to the leaked Slack logs and interviews, The Verge conducted with 14 former workers, but it was consistent with the pattern of behavior. Employees were asked to work exceedingly long hours and limit their paid time. Mouth. Yeah, this happens everywhere I've worked in. They've always put that pressure on you of booking every this is a good tip for everyone any place that you work in startup wise that says they have um unlimited holidays run if they have unlimited holidays run for the hills unlimited holidays means we're not going to limit your holidays but don't take too much unlimited holidays means you're not going to limit your holidays but when we need you you have to come in on the weekends that's what it means don't do it companies should have a policy in place of the times of the the amount of time there a lot for you to go away whether it's you know 25 days 28 days whether it's uh, uh you accrue like a month every year that you work there to take like a you know development week or a sabbatical whatever it may be but it should be in, in black and white a number something this whole unlimited holiday thing is bull crap what it results in is people coming in at eight staying until 10 sleeping on bean bags having a dog in the office walking around barefooted playing with a kadonga or kadumba whatever that thing is you put your ball in the little cup thing playing table tennis futsal talking about um steve jobs and elon musk every two minutes no work is work home is home there should be a separation between that and and if anything you'll perform at a much higher level if there is a delineation between you know how long you have to go you you know how long you have um holiday to visit your parents you're going to give a bit more effort at work as opposed to this you know airy fairy or pay time off for free time it's just some nonsense absolute nonsense anyway continues here in place of the, 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 the cutthroat culture allowed the company to grow at its hyper speed, developing a cult following with celebrities and millennials alike. Most of the cult following was because they gave away free luggage, to be honest, but also um, it opened a yawning between the gap between how Huawei appears to its customers and what it's like to actually work there. I've had the same thing in some similar cool companies I won't mention, but how they appear online is definitely not how it is behind closed doors. Behind closed doors is a lot more, you know, bang, 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 headbutts, but in front of people, they're like, oh my God, young people. For youth we love you um and it continues right the result is a brand consumers love a company culture that people fear and the kada and, and a kadar of former employees who feel burned out and coerced into silence uh they prey on people who who were never cool like me caroline says it's a cult brand and you get sucked into the cool factor because of that they can manipulate you they oh, that's an interesting quote they prey on people who are never cool that's true though that's the entirety of startups though isn't it most startup founders who are dickheads are usually people who would have never been cool in school who would probably get beaten up by people like me like similar like an Nicholas Oliver from people that I owe um those are the same people that run startups right there's that kind of idea of like you were always picked on in school and suddenly now you have you know you have the fucking key to the world in your hands um but yeah I don't know I don't know if that's that's an insult that's just how it is isn't it geeks run startup world then it? it's no big deal on that one uh it continues luggage is only the beginning yeah right what else can they do what's they're gonna make they're gonna start making hotels like really Get, get fucked anyway Corey and rubio met in 2011 uh while working at a trend direct at trendy direct to consumer iowa company called warby parker uh the things i learned there about retail markups and downs and wholesaling and licensing blah blah Corey said their aim was to sell first class luggage at a cost coach price but cutting out the middleman and marketing directly to consumers it was a model perfected by brands like dollar shave clubs glossier but i don't see why that's so um, revolutionary aren't most companies doing that anyway if you buy a, a luggage from a shitty shop around the corner isn't that direct to consumer oh they kind of the middleman i don't get why they're so revolutionary mostly from what i can see i don't know if they actually make that much money because most of the stuff that i've seen from away has been stuff that they've ceded free to influencers i've not seen anyone purposely go out and buy an away luggage people just usually buy really expensive luggage at Ramoa or buy really shit stuff from uh, argos or something it's no real in between i don't know maybe i'm wrong i don't know um Following this blueprint, Corey and Rubio post positioned away as a travel company, not a luggage company. We're working to create a perfect version of everything people need to travel. Seamlessly, Rubio said, uh, luggage only at the beginning. But what else can they do? Like what? Like pillows and stuff is to be on the plane. Um, to make their brand even more aspirational, away partnered with models and knit, and knit girls. Imagine, look, all these people didn't pay for anything, right? Carly Rose, Julia, Julia Roystein, Wrightfield, Rashida Jones. This is Rubia's wheelhouse. She managed social media strategy at Warby Parker and knew how to make a way hyper relevant. Uh, Corey, for her part, didn't have to work hard to project her special lifestyle. The CEO grew up in Ohio. 
She's rich with an indoor swimming pool and three dining rooms. She's gone to boarding school, then landed in Bloomingdale's executive development program while at Brown University. But for all her privilege, no one denied the executive's practical work ethic where Rubio's job seemed to involve glamorous travel and speaking events. Many employees say they never interacted with her. Corey was also in the office, was always in the office. She managed all the company's operations and was regularly online past 1 a.m. Bloody hell, woman. The CEO often v- v- facilitated between being funny and relatable to hypercritical and even cruel. Employees say she swore during interviews, cackled at people's jokes and took new hires to lunch, telling stories about her own mistakes. Once during an interview, a woman remarked that she was drawn to away because she was a millennial and it was a millennial friendly product. I'm a millennial too, Corey said. Later, that same employee was told by the manager that Corey had referred to the team on a bunch of millennial twats. <laughs> Corey was adamant. I quite like this woman, you know. She's a bit of a bitch, but I quite like her. Corey was adamant that clear feedback was critical to employees' growth. She was blunt when she didn't agree with someone and encouraged managers not to shy away from harsh criticism, which is great. Erica, who managed a small team, questioned whether the strategy actually worked. It didn't feel like I was helping my direct reports grow. Uh, again, that's being a bit too soft. I think the direct feedback is starting to something that we don't get too often. People sometimes sugarcoat the positives and the negatives too often, and it doesn't help the bottom dollar or the overall company to grow. So I think being radical candor, or radical honesty is the way to go forward. I think, especially in a fast moving industry like startups, you can't really risk or you can't really um, gamble on hurt, not hurting someone's feelings in that regard. You have to go on the front foot. You have to make sure people know when they stepped wrong or did the wrong thing or didn't approach it in the quote unquote right way so that you can kind of go back to the drawing board and come back again in order to kind of in order to kind of make the team grow. Because one thing I've noticed about startups, even though it can get quite frantic, it can get quite tense, as soon as you win, all those arguments are forgotten about, all the falling outs are forgotten about. You share a drink, you have a burger or something, you have a slice of pizza and everyone's cool again. But in those moments of preparation, of executing, you really do need people to be honest and kind of speak up and speak, you know, straight about things really, I would say. Um Da, da, da. When the photo when the photo team took suitcases to a, to a shoot in the Hamptons and brought them back banged up and covered in sand, an employee who started that week was blamed for the unacceptable error and called out publicly on snack. The bags had eventually made their way to customers and executives were furious. It would have just been a co-worker pulling them aside and saying, this isn't cool. Erica says they felt like they were publicly out in the situation so that everybody could follow along. But that was, come on. If you if they have a practice in, if they have a standard in place where if you take a bag on shoot, you have to make sure it comes back in a particular condition, you don't want to throw away stock that's fair right and if you make that mistake or it's been happening again and again and again because again there's no context here. you don't know how many times they've been warned about it. you don't know how many times it's been made public and it's taken attention it's like when you go to startups and the toilet or the kitchen is a complete mess sometimes calling it out in public is a bit annoying and a bit embarrassing but it is good to make everyone aware that this is a standard this is not acceptable and everyone should kind of step up that's okay isn't it Corey often framed her critique in terms of core company values, thoughtful, customer obsessed, it- iterative, empowered, accessible. Duh, duh. Empowered employees didn't schedule time off when things were busy, regardless of how much they'd been working. Customer obsessed people did often. Duh, duh. The intensity that promoted employees to form small groups chatting in texts about toxic company culture. Again, smalling in form groups, direct, go to the founder and talk direct about it. Speak up and open, speak, speak up and all hands, man. Don't be afraid, especially if it's causing you to go home and cry into your pillow or, or you know, sob to your partner or stuff or punch a wall. It's not worth it. You should be able to speak up. And if they let you go, it's not the right place to work at anyway. Do you know what I mean? You should be able to speak up about it. Um, but even this uh, seemed like it could, get, it could get them in trouble. From the beginning, Corey and Rubio had banned direct messages on Slack for anything related to work, which is strange or, st- or sustainably... This was supposed to make the culture more transparent over the course of our career journey. How can that? That's such a backwards way to lead, isn't it? No, no direct message on Slack because we want you to be front. Um, what do you call it? Honest with us, face to face. That's only going to make me not say nothing. Like it's a, it's just a counterintuitive way to do things. Um, transparency seemed to be like a pretense to correlate to micromanage and exert control. Marjorie's employees felt silenced by the cutthroat environment. Ironically, Corey described Ruby as her work wife when the pair had worked in Warby Parker. What was also nice about the relationship is that she also lean on each other to complain each uh, when the project wasn't going well. To Avery, this was just more a hypocrisy that way. The founders were allowed to complain to one another in private, but employees were expected to have an almost Every custom, every conversation in public. You are joining a movement. Oh, I hate that bit. Here's the one. In summer 2017, Lauren joined the way as a customer experience associate. She was one year out of college, filled at the prospect of working at a brand. She'd call, she'd seen all over the Instagram. At the time, her company had around 50 employees. The energy was light and support, supportive. 
due course of salary which was around forty thousand for customer support executive. Jesus Christ, a good 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 wage was a lot wasn't a lot to live on. Oh, of course in New York, I assume, right? But it was also out of the ordinary for someone just starting out in New York City. Lauren's job was to answer customer calls and emails, getting the queue of customers inquiries down to zero. On a busy day, Lauren and her coworkers answered 40 to 40 phone calls and runs 100 emails each. From the beginning, Corey and Rubio were masterful at getting these young employees hyped up about their jobs. You're joining a movement uh, they would say everyone wants to be part of this. <laughs> they went long hours and bonded over crazy stories, intoxicated by the energy in the company. Lawrence manager Zandi Payson, a woman who'd risen through the ranks, led the customer experience organization. That's always a good plant they do, right? They always get a manager in place that's kind of like, oh, she was a weekend employee and she's now the managing you guys to kind of rev you up, uh, give you more salary and obviously un- un- unlimited amounts of alcohol. But bloody hell, man, crazy! Um, when Corey needed the team to stay late, Payson would send Slack messages on her behalf, infusing her sense of her ways, values. What she would say, things like, I'll be working late tonight. Dinner is here for anyone who can stay and work beside me. I mean, leave it to you to say, oh, that's so manipulative. I'll be working late tonight. Dinner is here if any of you can work beside me. I mean, leave it if, leave if you have to, but I have to stay. Lauren's t- teammate, Caroline, says her messages were long and loving but they were manipulative. If she didn't, if she didn't hear from you, she just contact you directly, asking for verbal confession. You could work. <laughs> I love it. This woman's a warm, a fucking psycho. Um, as a holiday request approached, the team had to work around the clock to keep up with the customers' demand. In December, Caroline was wrapping up at work at one a.m. when she saw that message from Payson saying, "Okay, everyone, take a photo of your computer in bed when you get home. Here's mine." She's sitting at the bed wearing a face mask, still working. The queue of unanswered customers' emails kept growing. The team was just too small. To to keep up lauren and caroline uh, were working on weekends often eating dinner at midnight they told us just to keep pushing <laughs> ah this is a madness man this makes you look as it's so mad you so much of uh all the startups that worked like just absolute scumbaggery then on december 31st new year's day man, just before new year's eve you meant to be out there getting caned and just drowning yourself in alcohol patients sent him a message saying happy new year's eve uh she began and then laid out two scenarios either they could work take the day off as planned and the team would even fall more behind or they could each work six hours and get a month off as a reward i i'm taking that day off i'm sorry i don't, I don't want i don't want a month off that i haven't got in my hands yet that's not going to come either the, that month off that they put that they're telling you you're going to get is never going to happen either if they're always going to be how are they going to give everyone a month off does that make any sense they're going to cycle it in so you're going to wait what six months to get your month off like no nah, i'll take the new year's eve i'm not reading that entire email but yeah the whole article is there for you to check out it's very long very thorough and again it just goes to show just how toxic startups can be but i'm not surprised really startups are like that in a standard procedure so make sure you are aware of what you're getting into if if you're if the founders at your startup are toxic you owe them the benefit of the doubt no you owe them enough to kind of speak up in public about it i don't think these private slack channels do anyone any favors but in general i'm happy to see this get blasted out in public and i'm also quite relieved that it's not a male toxic environment because this would be even worse i'm glad now we're seeing that toxic toxicity in startups exists regardless of the gender it's just the way the, the companies are set up that kind of breeds this sort of environment. Um, so, yeah, um, hopefully this kind of leads to some change. And again, if you're on a way luggage uh, employee out there, keep strong, man. Keep strong because it sounds like you guys are working in absolute hell, man. Literally living.